This episode of Plastic Weekly is brought to you by Kirby Sheeman and the rest of my Patreon supporters who help make this show happen by donating a dollar or two each week. Kirby, thanks for joining the club and supporting Plastic Weekly. It turns out you live just down the street from me, so I put those stickers in your mailbox with my own hands because I got to save that stamp money. You know how it is. Um, Say hey to everybody at Rock Oasis, and thanks a lot, man. So this Saturday, I'll be back on YouTube casting the very exciting finals of the Ontario Open for everybody to see. So I hope you'll join and watch and preferably give me some feedback on the event. It's hosted at Boulder's Climbing Center here in Toronto, and I've always been a huge fan of their hold choices and more recently their epic new comp wall. So on Saturday, turn on the stream at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific or midnight out there in Central Europe, and we can watch some bouldering together. I'll put the link at the top of PlasticWeekly.com in the blue bar. This week's episode is about ninja courses. I've never tried a ninja course, but they're starting to pop up in gyms, and I'm sure you're all aware of many famous climbers who are spending more and more time doing this ninja thing. On top of that, a friend of mine was debriefing me on the clinic he attended where Udo Newman was the main clinician, and some of the thoughts and predictions Udo had were straying awfully close to some of the general concepts of the ninja world. So I need to learn a little more about this thing, and I figured I'd start with a longtime climber and gym runner who has recently become well acquainted with the ninja world. And here I have Joey Leno. He is the general manager of Aspire Climbing in Milton. Uh, Joey, thanks so much for taking some time to chat tonight. No problems, Tyler. We know we've been trying to do this for a while, so I'm glad we finally got a chance to uh, to have this conversation. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, it's We're talking about a Ninja Warrior stuff, which is, is something I feel like I don't know too much about, and I personally feel that it could play kind of a a big part in our sport or have have some hand in shaping it so I kind of wanted to go over the basics and so I know you uh, the general manager of Aspire you guys have one of these courses in your climbing gym so I thought you'd be somebody good to talk to and as I've been writing my questions the I realize I'm not really sure what to call the sport or the athletes that take part in it like should I be calling it ninja warrior are the athletes ninjas like what do I I need some like a lesson (laughs) in the vocabulary yeah, no problems. Uh, it's definitely known as Ninja Warrior because of the uh, the television show American Ninja Warrior. It's definitely made it popular. Um, and uh, in terms of athletes, they really are just athletes because uh, athletes that participate in the activity in the sport, um, they are they are true athletes. They definitely do a lot of training, a lot of preparation in order to compete. For okay. sure. Cool. Now, uh, before we get into it, um, I wanted to kind of ask what the circumstances were behind there being one of these courses in um, in Aspire Climbing, because I understand there's a, a bit of a connection between the business and having the product there. Could you explain that briefly? Yeah, no problems. Uh, so, <clears throat> Aspire Climbing, we're pretty we're a pretty unique climbing gym because we're actually the showroom facility for Rockworks Canada. And Ninja Warrior courses are part of our um, are part of our portfolio in terms of the products that we offer. So, when we built this gym, we wanted to make sure that we uh, we built a gym that offered everything. And it's kind of part of our uh, our our motto basically is to experience more. Uh, so it's not just rock climbing; it's Ninja Warrior, it's pure fitness, uh, it's it's everything. So we wanted to have a gym that had that had everything we had to offer. Um, I will say that we were the first gym in Canada to offer a Ninja Warrior. So when uh, when I started on the project, we weren't quite sure um, how it was going to go. But uh, we're almost two years in now, and it's been going great. And I think it's a, a good idea to explain your personal background. As much as you are part of this operation, you, you don't have that much personal experience with this equipment until just recently, right? Yeah, absolutely. I uh, didn't have any, in fact. I uh, didn't really know much about it other than watching a few clips of Ninja Warrior on the YouTube. Uh, so I had a little bit of famili- familiarity with it and familiarity with a lot of the like the athletes that have been successful in Ninja Warrior. They tend to be rock climbers or have a good background in rock climbing and training in rock climbing. So knew there was definitely some good connection between both sports. Just wasn't quite sure at the very beginning how it was going to play out for us. Okay, cool. That actually transitions into my first question really well, which is, who are the people that actually use this course? And we know that a lot of climbers get into this uh, Ninja Warrior stuff. 
Um, but at your facility in particular, which part of your customer base is is using this uh, this equipment? At the moment, um, <clears throat> we made a at the very beginning. We weren't sure how it was gonna how it was gonna be picked up. So we kind of geared the Ninja course for adults uh, to start with, and we uh, we wanted to make sure that it was uh, it was challenging yet accessible. Uh, but uh, as and, and I get the primary usage being for adults, but as we started, uh, as uh, the longer we were open, the, the more we started to realize that, well, Ninja's really hard and uh, adults weren't lasting very long on the course. And we had a few special events, a few special days where we opened it up for kids and we were just blown away with how long kids could go on the course. And then we made a fundamental switch uh, in uh, March of 2017 to open it up for kids and sort of flip our usage around for adults being the primary users to kids being the primary users. And I got to say that it was like probably one of the best business decisions we've ever made. Okay, cool. So most of these kids using it, um, I, I'm going to skip a few questions forward and ask you how you incorporate this Ninja Warrior course into the pricing structure of your gym. Like I know you operate like most gyms, you have day passes and memberships. How does that uh, come together and work with the Ninja Warrior course? Well, climbers, um, as you know, climbers are always looking for uh, the best possible rates for what they want to do. So at the beginning, we were thinking of offering a single rate that allowed you to do everything. But climbers who came in to climb, they didn't really weren't interested in the ninja course. So we separate our rates for climbing only and uh, what we call all access. And all access gives you access to climbing as well as ninja. And we also do offer passes for just ninja alone, uh, which ends up being a little bit less than the climbing alone. But to be honest with you, it's not. We don't get a lot of usage of that. Our most, uh, our highest level of usage is for all access. So people wanting to try everything. Okay. Um, I'm curious about this changeover you made when you realized that there was more of a market for kids. Um, we haven't really gotten into the technical stuff yet, but what kind of things were you changing? Like, you know, for root setting, you can talk about making, you know, roots better for kids versus adults. How does that translate into uh, this ninja stuff? It's exactly the same, actually, uh, as root setting, because for root setting, if you're setting for a, a, like a taller climber, uh, you're going to have bigger moves, longer moves. And as you know, when you're starting to set for kids, uh, things have to be a little bit uh, scaled down in reach, uh, scaled down in length. And it's exactly the same thing with the ninja course. Uh, some of the obstacles, the more challenging ones that uh, primarily adults use, for example, like the salmon ladder, it's not really something that's accessible for kids. So we kind of, you know, just tuck it up out of the way and, and save it for, for people who are more serious who want to give it a try. But it, it's, it's kind of a, it was kind of a, a challenge at the very beginning to identify the type of obstacles that would work for kids, but would still be challenging for adults. And at this point in time, it's kind of like everything, everything that's for kids is still challenging for adults. In fact, it's actually kind of fun. Um, but when we set the course for adults only, it it uh, it does make it too too difficult for some of the smaller kids to to be able to achieve, and we want to make sure that everyone has uh, enjoys it. So, it's it's a uh, it's a challenge making it accessible, um, but challenging and make it for everybody. But I think we've done a pretty good job at that now. Okay, uh, now something like. Uh, this kind of thing is, is you're effectively running through an obstacle course. And I think very quickly you would learn exactly how the course works. And it kind of comes down to optimizing how quickly you can get through it. That's, you know, the goal of this, but yeah. at some point like rock climbing, you probably get tired of a route. Um, so I'm assuming you guys kind of do a changeover as you would with route setting um, just to keep it fresh. Is that the case? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's that was a, something I was going to mention too. We do treat it like root setting. We do handle it like setting where our ninja course is on a rotation in order to keep it fresh for for our clients because you know, if you if you're on a, a stagnant ninja course or one that stays the same all the time or an obstacle course of any sort, um, it's harder to attract members uh, with with something like that. Definitely it's great the one-time visits and the drop-in visits but uh, it's more difficult for members to come in and, and enjoy it consistently. So we do have a rotation that takes place every three months. So I think we're all, um, 
we all understand the idea of root setting of using different holds uh, and you know changing where they go and changing which ones you use with uh, with other holds and wall angles. Everybody listening understands that idea. Um, how does uh, like what's the the analog to that in uh, Ninja courses? I like I understand the components are much larger, but is there a construction component? Um, is it is it as easy or as um, I just want to, how does it feel uh, when you compare it to root setting in terms of the number of possibilities you can get out of it? Well, it's similar It's similar to root setting in that <clears throat> you're uh, with a climbing wall, you're dealing with a wall and the holds are modular so you can reposition them in different spots based on what the root setter is trying to achieve. With the Ninja course, it's very similar. The framework itself is fixed and all of the obstacles are modular. And it's a matter of rearranging them, um, getting new obstacles, just like buying fresh climbing holds, to make sure that uh, that you're always giving uh, giving a new challenge. And some obstacles are harder than others, so it's about mixing it a lot, mixing it up. We have uh, three separate lanes of obstacles, so sometimes an ob- an obstacle that may have been over the foam pit, we'll scale it down and put it in a different lane, and just kind of change it up to to give uh, to give some variety. Uh, it is a lot of remixing of the same, but we're always trying to add new ones as well to keep it fresh. Okay. We we know that holds, like we feel like holds are expensive. Uh, as a price comparison to regular climbing holds, is it significantly more expensive to buy different components or is it, you know, roughly the same kind of thing? <clears throat> no, it is considerably more expensive. So when, when other gyms or other uh, facilities uh, purchase ninja uh, ninja obstacles or a ninja course. They typically don't uh, factor in um, purchasing some spare obstacles or obstacles that they can switch out. And it's definitely something that should be under consideration because, uh, like I said, you, your customers are always going to want to keep things fresh. So it's nice to have a back stock of different of different obstacles to make that rotation much easier. Okay. Um, I'm curious if you have any specific um, kind of things that you've learned as somebody that that uh, isn't from this world and you've kind of had to learn how to roll with it. Aside from those changes you made um, to uh, to making it more accessible to smaller bodies, uh, are there any lessons you guys have learned in how to arrange these things and how to affect the, the course? Um. Yeah, definitely. Like I said, we uh, we did switch up the usage for kids, so we always have to make sure that there is a good level of accessibility. It definitely is hard making it something. It, it, we have one ninja course to fit all, so it is a little, little bit more difficult. It's kind of like it's kind of like having uh, uh, like a, a few lines of roots in your gym with auto belays, and then uh, putting different. Uh, putting different climbs on them using different colored climbing holds. Uh, it's the same thing on the Ninja course, try to maximize the usage by having some variety within the same and making sure that it's accessible for kids. But if you want to skip some elements, it's going to be more challenging for adults or, or athletes that come in that are looking to train for this particular sport. That's a, that's a metaphor. I can understand really well the auto belays that works for me. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tried to put it, I tried to put it in, a, in a context that would make sense to people who'd be listening to this. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, now for, for like a, a modern ninja course, um, the course you guys have is kind of built into a kind of a corner of the facility. So you access yeah. it from two of four sides. Yeah. Uh, the only other one I've checked out firsthand is the new one at Altitude Canada, um, yep. out in Ottawa and they have it, I think they had some more space um, in theirs they seem to have two lanes that run uh, side by side for different people um, is there kind of a, a suggested amount of floor space that you guys recommend uh, people have for this or is it really something that can be effective in any uh, footprint it's definitely effective in in any footprint like it does start off with a basic framework uh, we we have a relatively small ninja course, and as you mentioned, the one in Kanata, which we actually built as well, uh, it's a much larger larger frame. Um, ideally, it would be great to have more space, but uh, if you've ever been to, well, you've been to Aspire Climbing, uh, for, but for listeners who maybe haven't, um, we tried to maximize the space by having a lot in there. And um, I, the based on the amount of traffic that the ninja course gets especially on weekends and special holidays and you know march break and summer and all that kind of stuff um and based on the amount of traffic that the course receives compared to some other aspects of the gym 
having a larger footprint for that would be would be a wonderful thing. Um, but it's definitely something that can be in a smaller footprint for sure. All right. Uh, what kind of gyms does this kind of uh, feature make sense for? It seems like when you switched um, to a more youth specific uh, course, in my mind, that means, okay, we're, we're catering a little bit more to birthday parties or weekend warriors looking for fun stuff to do uh, with their kids rather than for like a long term membership base. Um, so what kind of, what kind of gym should be looking to incorporate this? Is it something that's really great at drumming up new traffic? Is it for, you know, building a secondary base of consistent customers? Like, um, you know, who's, who are the people that should be considering adding something like this to their gym? Well, just, uh, you actually, you actually touched on it. Um, it's definitely great for uh, drumming up new traffic, uh, so for new drop in customers. Cause it is a great attraction. Uh, as mentioned earlier, it does get a lot of uh, a lot of um, traction on on social media and such. And watching the events on TV, it's quite it, it's it's a great thing to to watch. It's super entertaining. Um, so there's definitely a young audience out there that they want to try it. They want to be ninja with ninja warriors. They want to be the next ninja warrior. Um, but there's also a, a clientele like that participates in like mud runners and obstacle course racing and different type of events like that, that can benefit from, from having the ninja course. I think the key thing for us is because we're in Milton. Milton is a very family oriented city. Uh, we have a lot of young families here, so that's why it just makes sense for us as a primary usage to have it for kids. But there are other facilities uh, that offer ninja courses that maybe doesn't have the same uh, family demographic that we have, that it works quite well for people who participate in CrossFit um, and obstacle course racing and looking for a facility that offers that. Like it's, it, it's great for everybody. I think that was the thing that was most interesting for us was when, when we started, when we started with the course, um, definitely it was hard right off the bat. Uh, but it actually trans tra transitions really well into climber uh, to like uh for these clients to uh, to transition into climbing because they love the ninja course. It's a lot of fun. It's super exciting. But how do you get better at doing it? Well, a lot of the obstacles in ninja really involve grip strength, core strength, upper body strength. And a very natural way to gain that strength or to train that is rock climbing. And then you mentioned that and you mentioned how some of the best ninja athletes out there uh, incorporate rock climbing into their regular training and then they give rock climbing a try and as you know once you get into rock climbing it's extremely addictive so the ninja being that great first attraction to the facility to check it out and then we use rock climbing as the retention so they come into the facility to try this out and then they get attracted to rock climbing because they're like oh i want to give that a try too and rock climbing is a little bit more uh, a more dynamic, more fluid, there's more options, um, fresh root setting every week, things like that. So it definitely has more retention qualities in the rock climbing than in the Ninja Warrior. But the Ninja Warrior makes it an awesome attraction to, to draw new customers in for sure. Okay, cool. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a little, a little more abstract at this point. Um, we've been watching rock climbing change in style, uh, especially in bouldering, seeing a lot more agility-based stuff um you know you start running in different things and so there are certainly areas where rock climbing is starting to cross paths um with something like ninja warrior or obstacle courses um from your perspective as somebody that you know facilitates uh, a gym with one of these courses but also somebody that's you know involved in a business that is also marketing this what's the you know what's the current thought in in the prosperity of of a ninja warrior is it something that is intent or is expected to continue as a standalone sport over time will it always be a niche thing in the corner um are people expecting these things to eventually combine into one kind of agility based sport that's not quite climbing not quite ninja warrior what are people thinking i don't know i think ninja warrior is pretty interesting because it's not necessarily a new thing like the sport in itself originated from that. Remember that uh, that game show called Wipeout? Oh yeah, uh, the Japanese game show called Wipeout. It, re the, the reality is, it originated from that. Uh, like it's an American spinoff from that. So it's been around for a long time, and it's neat because Ninja Warrior. Uh, I mean, 
I mean, we're talking about that, but it's really just obstacles. Uh, obstacles are these types of obstacles are being incorporated in like kids' playgrounds and schools, and um, in anyone who participates in obstacle course racing, these obstacle course racing courses are incorporating a lot of these ninja style obstacles. So it's definitely something that's um, that isn't going anywhere from just a pure obstacle challenge standpoint. In terms of the actual Ninja Warrior thing, it hasn't become a like. There's definitely some desire for it to be uh, a sport in Canada to be to have its own even television program in Canada, but it doesn't have the same sort of marketing push that it does have in the U.S. So it's. It, like it is a, it's its own standalone thing, but I think it's just going to be continuously incorporated into other forms of obstacle course racing. And it's hard to say at this point whether it's going to be it's going to take off as its own thing in Canada, but um, it's definitely always going to be an attraction. Um, and it's great from that regard, because, like I said, how how valuable it is at, at drawing people in. That's funny. You mentioned the like the playgrounds thing, and I had this mm-hmm. flashback to uh, <laughs> um, when I used to play more music. We'd occasionally, you know, like truck out for a show. We had it was like a ten or eleven man band, so we had like a van full of us, and we would always load in like you know six or seven hours before the show starts. So we'd have nothing to mm-hmm. do for a while, so we <laughs> we would like find the nearest playground and like pull out our phones as timers, and we'd just like dick around on the playground <laughs> trying to like create these courses. And I'm realizing I accidentally did this ninja stuff like yeah you know eight years ago that gives me more <laughs> that makes me kind of realize how yeah i'm surprised i didn't think of that before but it is yeah, kind and of it, a... it's really interesting like because we're always looking at uh new obstacles we're always looking at new challenges and we deal with a lot of different suppliers too and as we deal with more and more playground suppliers as well we're going man they're making ninja obstacles in their playgrounds and if you really take a look at some of these new playgrounds that are being built they're fantastic they're like these micro ninja courses. Um, and it's amazing how the sport has influenced even just just everyday playgrounds. But it's not unlike these playgrounds are also incorporating rock climbing walls and, and, area, and natural rocks and areas of, uh, well, climbing. They're almost incorporated in every playground too. So I definitely see it as being a, an activity that's here to stay. Um, yeah, and it's just, it, like it really is just pure fun. So uh every anyone can enjoy it but yeah it's hard <laughs> <laughs> no that's that's uh that's funny way to to look at it um just cuz we're talking about it um uh, i guess manufacturers and suppliers are creating new obstacles for this ninja warrior stuff and in my head i seem to remember there was this idea that it was a fairly arm uh like a upper body strength um dependent sport originally yep. and i seem to remember somebody telling me that there was this push towards trying to make it a little more well-rounded um it, first of all is that true and also like how are these obstacles evolving are they are they starting to test like different skills or what's the trend right now well ninja warriors always incorporated uh skills of you know running jumping parkour um i to be honest with you i don't I don't follow the show very regularly regularly because I don't have cable TV. (laughs) Um, So I don't watch, I don't follow it on a normal basis, but from what I've been seeing, it's definitely something that uh, has been getting harder and harder over, over the past couple of years that I've been uh, familiar with it or been around it all the time. And um, what's interesting is uh, it seems like they're running out of uh, running out of obstacle ideas because athletes are just getting so good and getting so strong that how do you keep making it more and more challenging? So it'd be interesting, you know, you saying that if that's an observation that uh, that you're noticing, it could be very similar to to rock climbing or bouldering, for example, where um, in bouldering a lot of parkour style elements have been introduced over the years, and it definitely had it bouldering took a trend in that in that direction but now there's a desire to kind of bring an all-around component back into bouldering you know sometimes pulling on hard small holds is is a good way to challenge climbers too so that you're not favoring any one style maybe that's the exact same thing that's happening in ninja warrior i I honestly can't say because i don't follow it too closely from the television show program but uh but uh, i i don't see that as being something that's too far-fetched 
Yeah, the idea that, you know, we made bouldering harder by incorporating some of this obstacle course style agility, and it might be flipped that this obstacle course stuff might now see more influence from climbing. And yeah, yeah. Rather than campusing through monkey bars, maybe you're campusing through things that get closer to crimps kind of thing. Yeah, and it's interesting. Like it, it took such a, it took such a hard spin in that direction, and it's it it really narrowed down the the type of athletes that could do it. Like, man, the courses in the show were really really hard, um, but it made it exciting. And I think that was the biggest attraction to it was that it's like no way that's impossible. And then seeing some of these athletes achieve these things, it's like whoa, it's pretty amazing. But what's cool about it is that they all like a lot of these athletes, they train so hard in rock climbing in order to build that type of upper body strength. Yeah, that's wild. It's pretty amazing. Like the, the the combination of the two sports, they do marry really well together. Huh? Anyway, I'm going to let you go. Um, I know it's a a late night for you, but um, thanks a lot for talking. And now that I know a bit more about this, I'm sure we'll talk again in the future. Maybe when I have uh, some more specific questions or something. Yeah, no problems at all. I appreciate we got a chance to do this finally. Yeah, it was good talking to you, man. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, thanks, Tyler. That's it for this episode of Plastic Weekly. Thanks to Joey Leno for answering my questions, and thanks to you guys for listening. Plastic Weekly is presented and produced by me, Tyler Norton. If you liked this episode, consider donating a dollar or two each week to my Patreon at patreon.com slash plasticweekly, or just leave a rating or review in your podcast app. It's crazy how much ratings help other people discover the show, so it would mean a lot to me. Make sure you visit plasticweekly.com to find footnotes, references, and other bonus content related to our episodes, including photos of a couple of the ninja courses we described in the episode. If you want to get in touch with me, you can leave a comment at plasticweekly.com and you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can send me an email to tyler at plasticweekly.com with your comments, concerns, questions, compliments. Just tell me you're out there somewhere. Good luck to everyone competing this weekend, including at the Ontario Open and at the CSGO Major in Boston. Don't let me down, SK Gaming. I'm all in for you guys. Talk to you next week.